Hello. Today on Nilda Live, my guest is author and leadership consultant, Greg McEwen. Welcome, Greg. It's great to have you here. It's great to be with you, Nilda. Thank you. Ah, you are an advocate of an idea, essentialism, and it is the title of your best-selling book. So we're going to get into it deeply today, but I'd like for you just to tell the audience in a nutshell what essentialism is. Essentialism is a way of thinking. It's an ism. And the way of thinking is to look at your life through, uh, well, really removing a lens from your life uh, so that you can see what is essential. It's removing this clouded set of distractions that make us believe that everything is equally important uh, and, and suddenly to see clearly that only a few things really matter and a lot of other stuff is, is uh, less important or even completely unimportant. And so then once we see in that way, we start to remove the non-essentials, just get rid of them, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps negotiate so that other people do some of those things or even we just reduce the amount of energy we're putting into it so that eventually our life becomes more and more centered and focused on those things that are essential, very important. And we have the satisfaction of, of being able to live a life that really matters uh, and, and not feel so uh, burdened with other people's agenda for us and, uh, and not feel just busy but not productive, not feel so stretched too thin at work or at home, uh, not, not feel like our day is just a, a function of other people's uh, you know, agenda hijacking ours all the time. Essentialism is seeing clearly uh, what really matters mm. and doing it. You came to um, essentialism through something that happened in your life that really kind of woke you up. Could you tell the audience about that incident? One of the experiences, I think the one you're referring to, was when I got an email from my manager at the time uh, who's, who, who emailed me. They said, uh, Friday between one and two, would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby. Uh, <laughs> my wife was expecting, otherwise it's a weird email still to have sent. But look, I mean, we, I, we went into the hospital, my wife and I, Anna and I, and we're, we're there. Our daughter's born in the middle of Thursday night, probably Friday morning. Uh, and instead of being focused, instead of being able to just enjoy that and live that, essential time, I'm feeling torn. And this is precisely the idea of this non-essential lens or, or, or clouded vision. I'm just saying, oh, it all needs to be done. And how can I keep, how can I keep my manager happy? And I, I, I don't want to strain that relationship. And I, how, do I, how do I make progress in my career? And I keep my wife happy, my daughter happy. And you're trying to do all of it as if it's all equally important. And so to my shame, I went to the meeting and, you know, the, the, I remember my, my manager saying, look, the client will respect you for the choice you just made, you know, but, but I, I didn't, I don't know, the look on the faces didn't evince that sort of confidence uh, of these, these clients. And so even for them, it seemed like they maybe weren't so sure about my choice, but, but even if they had, it was clear to me, uh, and, and certainly in hindsight, clear to just everyone that I'd made a fool's bargain. And what I learned from that was if you don't prioritize your life, someone or something else will. And so that story is on me because I hadn't taken proper responsibility for actually prioritizing, for actually eliminating something less important so that I could really be focused. And, and, and that has given me uh, some fire for the deed to be able to teach these ideas, you know, far and wide. So as we look at this, let's talk about your term non-essentialist. How do you define that term? Well, a, a non-essentialist, in my mind, is, um, is quite, well, it's quite a, a compassionate definition uh, because it's someone who is driven, uh, capable, curious, uh, well-intended. Um, I mean, in lots of ways successful, they could be an overachiever in a variety of ways. Uh, the the what the problem is like uh, like a growing cataract uh, where where at first we just start to feel a little cloudy you know we've been we're basically the cloud is uh, is an idea a false idea outdated set of assumptions like 
uh, mentioned probably the jugular one, which is everything is equally important. So your job is just to do as much as possible. Uh, success is just getting as much from point A to point B. The whole productivity movement can be unintentionally a pusher of this cataract uh, way of seeing the world. And, and so if you don't treat a cataract that over time it can, uh, you know, makes it harder and harder to see clearly, to s- discern what matters from what doesn't. It's hard if you have a cataract eventually to read is hard to, 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 to go and exercise would be hard to drive would be dangerous and hard and, and so on. Eventually it could make you blind. Yes. Now, now, None of that implies that the person with a cataract is somehow um, character, you know, I don't know, uh, deformed in their character or weakened in some way. They just have something that's making it hard to see. In the same way, a non-essentialist is someone who's going through life without knowing that they even have this uh, cataract in front of them. It, they don't understand that for many people. They don't even know they're seeing through a lens. They're just doing what they think everyone else is doing. And so it's quite a wake-up call. Maybe they don't have a moment like I have, but it's quite a wake-up call, even as people read essentialism, for example, sometimes is reading it. People have told me they'll be reading it and underlining things, and they're like, my goodness, I just didn't know I was doing it this way. I didn't know I was making a choice to see through this lens. I didn't know I'd been conned <laughs> into thinking this is the way to do life. Uh, this is the way to lead. This is the way to, and suddenly they discover, I can take this lens off. I can see with new eyes. We know, Greg, people are scattered a million different directions and things are just coming at them with their devices and everything like that. So wouldn't a lot of people just say, this is modern life. You know, I just need to accept it and go with it as it is. Yes, I think a lot of people do exactly that. Uh, that they, don't, they don't even do it with as much awareness as, as that language implies. It's not even just, well, it's modern life and I, and I guess I'll do it. It's that they, they just don't even discover it's a way of doing anything. It is just life. It is totally normal. So this non-essential way of living becomes invisible. And we're like fish who discover water last. We don't even know that this is a way of being. We don't, we don't, we don't. So, so therefore, we have given up our right to choose our way of living, leading, choosing, deciding, selecting. We've given that up without even knowing it. And that's precisely the risk. So yes, I think the answer is clearly yes to your question. What I want is for people to consider, how is it working? <laughs> yes. You know, non-essentialism, if that lens is working well, I mean, obviously I'm using a, a pejorative description to say it's a cataract, but, but if that cataract is working well for you, well, keep going. You know, like if it's producing what you want, if it's giving you the things you say you want in life, if it's giving you high quality of life, great standard of living, uh, present, important, uh, re- that you are having a great relationship with the people who matter most to you. If you are able to contribute and concentrate on the things that you feel you have a mission in life to achieve, I mean, if it's doing all that for you, by all means, continue. Seriously. You know, don't worry about essentialism because it's already working. But on the basis that maybe non-essentialism is not producing what it promised on the packaging, that it actually doesn't give you high quality of life, high quality of relationships, breakthrough results, a joyful experience in life. On the basis, it does not produce those things. And my experience is that it really cannot produce those things. Right. Then look for an alternative. If you want a way out, then the way out is to become an essentialist. So in that vein, let's talk about opportunity costs and what those are and what that means. Well, I mean, for you know, non-essentialism um, promises 
and this is just sort of in the air. It's not like anyone explicitly says it, although you can find it in magazines, articles online and so on. You can see that it's the assumption is there, but, but that what it promises is, is you can do everything. You can just do it all and there's no cost to anything. So uh, if, if you, if you've been doing something in the past, I mean, the sunk cost bias specifically is the more you have invested in something, the more, you will feel obliged to invest in it in the future. So even where you're down a path that doesn't serve you, or you're on a project that is costing tons of money, not pr producing any of the results you were hoping for, but you feel emotionally so pulled in it that you keep going. And that's sunk cost bias, is that you're throwing good money after bad. You just keep going and going and going down this path. The, the, the essentialist uh, is someone who has a heightened awareness of that. So that they're, they're saying they're really, they're not saying, Hey, how can I more efficiently do everything I'm already committed to doing? They're saying, do I even want to commit to this again? If I was starting right now, would I do this? If I, knowing what I know at this juncture, would I put another dollar into that? Would I keep going with this project? And, and it's a helpful way to be able to at least question all these activities that have become unquestioned, mm -hmm. uh, it, it default, assumed. You have to. I just have to. I have to do this. I'll give you a perfect example of this. We had, um, through, through an unusual situation, I, had, I, I entered a bet with a, a wager, with a, <laughs> no money, uh, with a friend <laughs> of mine. Uh, they... they, they, they Anyway, I win the I win the wager, and the, what it means is that they're going to take my son to to uh, to uh, baseball season all season long. They're going to pick him up, take him, bring him back every time, and uh, and then as we enter the season, even though we don't have to even take him and so on, it just starts to feel like well, that's still going to be quite a burden on our family, on the time, it's going to be quite a burden on him as well. And we suddenly start to realize this. Well, some cost bias would say, well, it's too late to do anything about that. You have to carry on now. You've already signed up and you've already committed and somebody's already taking him. And, and of course, he'll be, he'll be disappointed if you don't do it. The essentialist, and we did in this case have the presence of mind to be essentialist. We say, well, we don't have to. We're choosing to because why? Well, we're choosing to because we think he'll be disappointed. See that we make the, the sunk the cost bias explicit. Well, mm -hmm. this is why we think we have to do it. So we're choosing to, and this is why. Well, we can test that by saying, son, come in here. And we say, Jack, look, we're just thinking perhaps about not doing the baseball season. We just want to know before we even make a decision about that, how you feel about it. Oh, that'd be fine, Dad. No problem. I mean, he didn't care at all. It was no loss. There was no part of him that was attached to it, that was pining for it. It was just us that felt that he would be attached. Right. And so we saved three or four months of extra burden, <laughs> assuming that it would matter so much. Well, that's the kind of rebate essentialists can achieve. Uh, in this case, time and other resources but of course, repeated many times, you can free up enormous amounts of energy and, and, and resources and space in your own life. You know, it's interesting. I was raised by post-depression parents. And some of this, it's a different, it's slightly different. But some of this is I saw in their lives based on, on the value they sunk into things that they were able to purchase and have and whatever, and because of the economy doing better and they kind of had this sort of mentality and i think had, had difficulty moving with the idea when other people were more essential about things do you see i mean have you ever seen that have you even yeah t tell me a little more like does it seems like there's a specific example you have in mind of what they... well in, in other words like if you if you if you went to college to study this well, we spent the money that we didn't ever have when we were younger because we were post-depression kids. So we spent the money on that college education, and that's what you need to do because that's what you studied. Yes, I, I could certainly imagine that, that, that when options were fewer, you took the decision maybe a bit more seriously, and you said, no, that's it. You're in. You're in, for, you're in forever now. Uh, and and I, I, I could see that. I don't know if that's 
post-depression era reasoning or not, but I think that many people have that same feeling of I've committed down this path. Therefore, even, even if I have the feeling or the dread that it's the wrong path, I've just got to keep on going. And this exact moment happened to me in my own life where I was, uh, I mean, this is really the story behind the story of essentialism is uh, 20 years ago, I was staring at a piece of paper in my hands with all these scribbles and answers to the question, what would you do if you could do anything? Mm -hmm. And as I'm looking at that, I notice not so much what I've written down. I notice in a moment what I haven't written down and I hadn't written down, go to law school. <laughs> and that was really important because I was at the time at law school. <laughs> ah. And I was visiting friends in the United States, uh, and I had, uh, you know, I was at law school in England. Well, what do you do about it? Uh, do you just, okay, put that away, pretend I didn't see that? Well, there was no putting me back in the original packaging. I, I never could get my head back into the place I was before that moment. And so I called my parents from the United States, and I, my mother answers the phone. Uh, fortunately, uh, she, she listens for a while. She says, I think you better talk to dad. And uh, so he comes on the phone. All right. Now, seriously, what would you say? Uh, what, what would you say, Nelda, if, if you were my dad and, and, and your son's calling you from halfway in the other world? I mean, pick up the phone. What are you going to say? <laughs> Have you lost your mind? <laughs> well, hello, dad, dad is I, maybe, maybe, but, but, uh, but, I just think I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm going in the wrong direction. So do you want me just to keep going in the wrong direction? Just go further down the wrong path? Waste more money, more time? What do you think, Dad? Well, <laughs> what do you want to do, son? Please. I have a very vague sense that I'd like to teach and write. Mm. I've been There's thinking no money about in that. <laughs> I've been thinking That's about, a dad answer. <laughs> I've been thinking about it seriously for about the last 20 minutes. 20 years, of course. <laughs> Is that okay? Can I quit or not? What, what do you say, Dad? I think you need to come home. <laughs> we need to talk about this at home. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're breaking up here, Dad. I just have to go. <laughs> All right. So this is the interaction. Like, what do you do in this moment? Because you're in a situation right there. I've given you it. It's a real circumstance. Sunk cost bias makes you here feel you've got to keep going. Don't throw away the opportunity, right. Greg. Don't, don't. You've already invested. You're already in it. We've put money in it. We've put energy. You're here. You've got to carry on. Isn't that precisely what we're talking about? Oh, here? exactly. And now, even though we're talking about it, even though you understand it logically, even, even though we're talking about an actual situation that happened 20 years ago, and even though, I mean, I did quit law school. That's, that's sort of the, 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 the law school gone. Uh, decided instead to teach and write, uh, worked out quite well, right? Like we're 20 years on, you have me here on the podcast because of the New York Times bestseller essentialism that I wrote and so like, you know that it actually turned out and still it's hard for you to have that conversation. Oh yes. That's the power of sunk cost bias. So what we need to do is we need to try and liberate ourselves as much as possible from these kinds of burdens, these emotional burdens that keep us uh, trapped. Yes. In fact, a friend of mine said it this way. He said, success traps are harder to get out of than failure traps. Mm. Well said. I, th I think that's right because failure tra traps, you're incentivized to change, but success traps, you're incentivized to keep going. Yes. And, 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 and that's what I could have been in now. I mean, it's a, it's a first world problem, law school, no law school, of course it is, but nevertheless, it changed both the direction and the trajectory of my life to know that I could choose something different. Actually, here's what my dad said. What, what he said in this moment is he, he, he listened, um, which isn't entirely like him. He listened and he said, uh, he said, he became quite Churchillian about the whole thing. He, he said, uh, son, <laughs> You know what we've always told you. And I'll tell you what he'd always told me was go to law school. I'll tell you that for free. But that is not what he recalled in this moment. In this moment, he said, uh, he said well, we've always told you, because, because all Englishmen, as you know, quote Shakespeare uh, over tea and crumpets for breakfast in the morning. 
he pulls a line, this is really true, straight out of Hamlet. He said, he said, here, he said, to thine own self be true. Uh, to thine own self be true. And then the, the other thing I remember him saying was, was a quote from a, a children's hymn. And it says, uh, it says, choose what is right, let the consequence follow. And what he was saying, what he got exactly right at that moment was, and, and this is my language now, do what's essential now. Mm. Figure out what is essential now and do it and let the consequences be what they'll be. Let your own inner voice, that clarity, speak clearly. Follow that. Not just follow your passion. Passions could be very distracting too. They could, but there's something different when you get quiet enough, still enough to hear your own you know, voice guiding you. That still a smaller voice leading the way that light when you can have that be the guide not the social pressure to finish law school not the not the fear of missing out what other people are doing not the fear of a better option coming along but just following what is within you and taking courage to act upon it immediately mm -hmm. this is really the way of the essentialist you also talked about the difference between or, or the change in the way that we say the word priority. Tell the audience about that because I find that fascinating as well. Yes, this, this illustrates uh, how cluttered the non-essentialist perspective is because you can just trace the word priority back to its original source. It, 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 it came into the English language in the 1400s um, and it was singular. Right, there was one priority singular. Wow. Well, what did it mean? Well, actually, the word meant the same then as it means now. Priority just means the priorest thing, the first thing. It has to be singular. It has to be because that's the whole point of the word. It's the first thing, and yet somewhere five hundred years later, uh, you know, in the midst of the industrial revolution, where we were up, there was this upheaval i think going on just anywhere in society and we were having to throw out all sorts of old paradigms for new ideas and and that was all very a lot of that very positive but some of the things that were positive got lost you know baby out with the bathwater, and this definition priority seemed to get either lost or strained because some somebody started talking of priorities well let's just have very very many very first things <laughs> Now, of course, you can have priorities in the sense of many things that are important, but you can't have very many first things. Mm -hmm. And that's where that word, restoring that word priority is so helpful, because what we want is to know what's the most important thing. That can be a bit overwhelming if, if, you, you know, if you're not quite sure how to apply it. But what I think you do is you just say, well, what's most important now? What's important now? And that's where we're trying to do exactly what we just did before, discerning. You know, figure out what's essential and do it regardless of the consequences. You do the important thing now. And then the next moment, the same. Clear away the clutter. Clear away the distractions. Turn the TV way down. Turn the social media off. Get still. Get quiet. What's important now? And you do it. And life becomes really a process of doing that again and again. That's the work of life. Mm. So let's talk about what trade-offs are. What are those? This is, this is the, uh, the thing that must be embraced to become an essentialist, uh, is the reality of trade-offs. Non-essentialists believe, because non-essentialism teaches, that you can do it all and have it all. Uh, the essentialist believes what is clearly more true, uh, that you can do, yes, anything, but not everything. You must, and in fact, not just must, that's the wrong way of saying it. You will make trade-offs. You cannot not make trade-offs. True. Every time you say yes to anything, you're saying no to many other things. So an essentialist just faces that reality with honesty instead of pretending 
well, I can shove it all in, fit it all in and have it all. Uh, so you, you embrace the reality of trade-offs is, is an accelerating way to live because you start to make them thoughtfully and deliberately. And so then it gives you the power. I'll give you an example in my own life. Um, I started this practice just quite recently, but uh, I finished my workday here at home in the COVID era uh, at five o'clock. Uh, and certainly not later. Could be earlier, can't be later. And one of the ways I hold myself accountable to that is I walk out of the office here and as I'm walking out, I literally call out to the whole family like it's uh, like I'm a town crier. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's five o'clock, you know, whatever time it is, 4.59, uh, 5.01. And that helps keep me honest. It helps me make the trade off more thoughtfully, deliberately, so that, and, and I do it every day. I was, I was on an event, we were doing a webinar, it was across the world. And I, I was telling them that story, in fact. I was sharing that practice. And as I said it, I said, look, you're going to need to help me because we're 10 minutes before five right now. And when it's time, I'm out. And, and when we got feedback from that session, it was like that was almost the most important thing we talked about was them seeing me actually do it. <laughs> that we, <laughs> you know, we could have carried on for another 15, 20 minutes easily. Stopped right one minute before so I could walk out and announce it. That's, that's a practical illustration of trade, trading off so that you don't just stay in the office at six o'clock and it's seven o'clock and it's 7.30 and it just goes on. There's no reason not to. It feels like there's no reason not to. But every minute I'm in here, I'm not out there. That's a trade off. Let's get practical. You've convinced me there's a big problem. Hopefully other people are listening that they understand uh, what is going on uh, in, if they have a non-essential world. Um, let me just use some of my life as an example. Okay, Greg, I, I, uh, I know it's hard for people to say no. I get asked to join all kinds of boards, uh, to donate to charitable causes, to come to this gala, that gala, all these different things, right? It's co- co-producer of successful of a successful Broadway show, uh, The Prom. And after that happened, then I had a lot of people ask me to join as producer for different projects. Um, How do I know when to say yes and when to say no? Um, Let me make a general observation and then I think we need to make a choice together. Uh, The the general observation is that your progress and contribution will plateau at the same level as your selectivity. Hmm. So eventually you'll have another options and opportunities that will fill your available time and resources. And so if you just say yes to X number of things, you'll be full. You'll be so full you couldn't really take on anything else but nor would you even be able to create space to figure out what ought to be next. Mm. You'd just be consumed at the current level. In order to break through to a high level of contribution, you have to increase your selectivity. You can't go from zero to 10, because then you just, somebody would just have no options and no opportunities left. There'd just be nothing. The door's closed and they're alone and isolated. That's probably not what they want. But, you, as, as the contribution increases, the selectivity has to keep increasing. And so you may well find yourself saying no to options and opportunities and, and invitations that even six months ago or a year ago, you would have said yes to. In fact, you might have jumped at those chances a year ago, but now you need to be more selective in order to, not to be selfish, but in order to open up a higher level of contribution ahead of you. Uh, for the things that really do matter most. So that's my sort of general answer to that question. Thoughts? Oh, yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, it's interesting because I see it in uh, so much in, uh, if you will, hindsight. The truth is, when I began to say no to different things, I got to have more time, right, to open up for uh, more thinking and more consideration for for even different paths, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, So why do we as people have trouble letting go of the clutter, whether it be in our homes or in our heads? And why do we have trouble letting go of those things? Uh, well, one of the reasons is it's a, 
that there's a heuristic, so a, a bias that almost all humans have, and it's called the endowment effect. Uh, and the endowment effect basically means you value things more because you have them. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really helpful bias uh, because it helps us to, for example, we look after our homes better if we own them. Uh, you know, it explains why no one in the history of the world has ever washed their own rental car. Uh, you know, <laughs> when, when you own it, you treat it better, you value it higher. That, that's the upside to the endowment effect. We wouldn't want to rid the world entirely of that bias. But it's a bias with um, a point of diminishing returns. Once you value something disproportionately, once you value it higher than its actual value, then you could have yourself a whole set of problems. Uh, literally, you could apply this, you can see this problem in most people's or at least many people's closets, right? I mean, literally, if you walk into most people's closets, if they said pictures in right now, uh, we, we would see non-essentialism on display. Absolutely. <laughs> too many things, too packed together, um, stuff we don't wear, uh, things we haven't worn in years, things we've never worn and really are never likely to, but somebody gave it to us so we feel obliged. And, and so this would be the thing, stuff on the floor. Uh, what, we've, what we see there is literally non-essentialism, you know, um, revealed. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't actually make most people happier, more joyful to have that kind of clutter. But... But I think a lot of people listening or watching to this will relate to the experience of saying, okay, I've had enough with the closet. I'm going in there. I'm going to clear this thing out. But in the act of doing that, they walk into the closet, they take an item off the shelf as if to get rid of it. And in that moment, something mysterious and almost magical seems to happen. You know, we look at it, that item, and we think, <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, you know, I get... I mean, let's just pause. First of all, in that moment, have you had that moment, Nelda? Oh, I've had that moment. Absolutely. What, yes. what do you think in that moment? What is the thought you have as you're holding it? But it looks so good and I may wear it. I, I, I may wish I hadn't given it away. Right. So there we go. You, 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 two things happen right there. First is I could possibly wear this again in the future. There is a possible use to it, a possible value. Which, of course, the, if that's the criteria, the answer has to be yes. There is, a, there is always a percentage chance, a possibility, a probability greater than zero that that could be of some use to someone at some future scenario. Right, so it's very broad, and it means the answer is going to be yes to keeping it. It also shows that we, in the moment of wanting to give something away, we get, in that moment, a heightened awareness of how we might value it. So in the act of giving it away, we, we have like this peak of valuation. It's, worth, it's been worth nothing on our shelf. We haven't thought about it in a second. But then, in fact, if someone had eliminated it from the closet, we might never have noticed. We might never have cared. But in the moment of doing it, looking at it, we value it too highly. So what we need to do is trick our brains by this, using this question, which is what, you know, if I'd never bought this item, how much would I pay for it now how valuable mm. is it to me right now and for many items that gets it we say well we wouldn't even do it let's just get, we'd never do it those clothes that aren't mildred borders or a grandmother bought it or a parent or whatever that, or a sister gave it to has never been used and we think, whatever right we think we've got to it's got some value but we say well we would never have got it for ourselves so let's thank it and pass it on we, we could use Marie Kondo's essentialist question, does it spark joy, right? We've all heard mm, that now. Yes. Does it spark mm -hmm. joy? All she's doing when she asks that question is, is she's using an essentialist question. My, my version of that would be the 90% rule. If it's not a 90% or above yes, it becomes an automatic no. And so we're, we're talking here literally about closets, but this is how you would go from a non-essentialist closet to an essentialist closet. You take everything out, you select only those things that spark joy or a definite yes. You wear them often. You love to wear them. You use them and they, they, they go back in and everything else is eliminated, passed on to someone else. And, and that's the process you'd, you'd go through. 
in our lives, it's the same kind of pro process. Start to pay attention to everything you're doing. You might take a day and, or a week and just actually just keep an accounting of everything I'm currently doing with my life so that you can look back and, and, and evaluate your week and say, well, how much of that was essential? How much of that was trivial? How can I start to prune the trivial, the trivial many, so I can give life and energy and space to these essential few, these vital few? So in your book, you refer to that as sunk cost thinking is that right the the idea that we we put a value go ahead and define it i'm sorry no well sunk cost bias is just where we we value it more because we've been investing it in the past yes the endowment effect is another version of a similar idea which is just we value it because we have it it's just because we own it ah, okay. uh, so so like the, the the literal example of this is that you they, they um you know, they've, they've conducted experiments in, 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 you know, classrooms where they'll give people these mugs that are worth about $2, but because they own them, when they come to negotiate, they, they won't take less than a higher amount. They, they, they wrestle and fight before they're willing to give this up. So they overvalue the item simply uh -huh. because it's theirs. And so we, we, we have to be careful that we aren't chaining ourselves to not just the stuff in our closets, but the stuff in our schedules, our lives. the commitments that we have, the, the, not even just the commitments, the expectations we've taken on all these, all this stuff that we believe we need to, to keep a hold of. Why, why do we need that stuff? Let's let, if we started our lives again today, would we sign up for all that? expectation all those activities all those projects or would we choose something else you know it's interesting that people do put all those activities in i'm amazed sometimes at the level of things that a single family will try to do with their children and their family yes uh, over scheduling is is a is an evidence of non-essentialism all the time and and in in times of covid a lot of people have discovered well maybe they didn't need some of those things that they used to think were unquestionable they had to do them well they're not and for some people they're perfectly happy without them yes. uh, they might even be happier without some of that running around uh, which is a kind of amazing thing so here's what i have for you though i have a question for you so we'll do okay. this we'll do the micro version of this okay so right. so you're asking how to apply essentialism and we keep being i keep either being metaphorical or conceptual about it but if you're game for this okay. I want to put you on the spot are you, are you up for this First thought to a question. First thought that comes to you. What is something that is very important to you, essential to you, but you're currently underinvesting in it? First thought. Mm. Spending time with my two younger girls. Okay. How old are your girls? 11 and 12. Um, wh why does this matter so much to you? Why You said it was very important. It's essential. I want you to give it words for a moment. Why does spending more time with them matter to you? It matters to me because they get to know me and I get to know them. And it is very, it's the relationship that I want to make sure is strong. Okay. You, you, you want to, this is time, time with each other is how you even have a relationship. Yes. And why does having a relationship matter so much to you? Mm. Because I adore them. I love them. And we are hitting the preteen years. And it is just important because I know what's coming up. I've, I've already raised two adult children. I know what's coming up. And I know the importance of that time spent together. Okay, you've got, given us a little more now. You, you've said, you've said I, I recognize a window of opportunity and, and a window of risk. If I take the chance to build a relationship now, I can have a relationship with them through those teenage years and post when they leave. But if I don't invest in this, I could see it being very hard, very rocky through the teenage years. And maybe the relationship doesn't really continue in the long term. So you can see that this is, you, 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 there's, there's a high stakes window that you're approaching. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. There is. Uh, give me one more level of why it matters. Like, why does it matter that you don't have this strained relationship now and this, you know, maybe non-existent relationship later? Why does that matter so much to you? 
It matters to m- so much to me because I know that knowing who they are and their gifts, I know their gifts and talents, but knowing what makes them tick, what is their bent, what where they really want to be, kind of like your father saying to you, to your own self be true. It is essential to me as a mother to be able to encourage them in those areas and help them get what they need in those areas. And it, I, I know that pouring that into them is essential. What I think you just said is that you believe that each of your daughters has their own uh, mission, their own purpose. There's a, they, they were cre- created with purpose and you want for them to be able to fulfill the measure of that creation. You want them to be able to live out that fully. Absolutely. And, and so what you just said is not it's life and death for you, but you've said it's like the essence of life for you. Yes. This is what life is about. This is its purpose at its most central core description. Mm. Yes. So that's important. That's profound to be able to give it that language. Now let's go forward. What does success look like in terms of the adjustment? I I am confident that you are not spending zero time with them. And I'm confident that your goal isn't to spend 24 seven with them. So give me like, what's the adjustment you feel you need to make to invest appropriately or to at least make progress? X more time per day, per week. Tell, tell, me, tell me what that looks like. Um, more individual time with the girls, uh, which we are currently scheduling. And um, also uh, part of our schedule for this next year was to absolutely decide on a online learning platform versus in-school platform. Uh, not always just because of COVID, but because COVID broke some things, if you will, that were... Uh, needing to be broken (laughs) some you know and it revealed some things for us that we needed to change and so in that we took the opportunity and saw the opportunity to continue uh in that vein and and also to travel more as a family next year we believe that there will be a time of traveling that will return and so it's very important to have some of those first experiences with them and to take them places that i want to change their perspective and how they see the world so therefore we have already started scheduling those things in for next year um which will be one-on-one time and also family time you you see i heard two different things and the main thing but i want to come back to the other as well the main thing i heard was about you know covid broke you know Every, every breakthrough is a break with it bro- break. You broke with the traditional schooling, the social groups that are involved, the influence cycles, the networks, the social media cycles, all of that. It broke with all of that. And suddenly it was a, a bit of an awakening and a bit of an opportunity to say, Oh, well, we don't have to, we don't have to buy into any of that scaffolding. There's a different yes. way to build this family. There's a bit different way to do the education. And, and part of that, so there's, there's quite a profound change taking place in your design for next year. And, and that's already in the works. You already have that intent. You're going to travel. You're going to do education together. You're going to influence. You're going to be a teacher, not just to other people out there, but to your own daughters. And so you can tell, I can tell your mission. You have a sense of that. You're excited about that. You see that. The other thing you said, which was a smaller point, but I think might be the thing that the, the missing piece, the thing that you say, oh, that's what I'm not doing currently, is the one-on-one time. Mm. Because I hear this travel and I hear this being together and all of that is more time in the home. And then, of course, once travel returns, more time out there, but it's still together. And I think what you're, I'm taking a stab here, but I think that you're saying, I wish I actually had scheduled time one-on-one with them. Yes, Mm-hmm. There's a very different dynamic when you're one-on-one. When, when travel was, was a thing, I traveled quite a bit and I would almost, well, 80% of the time I would travel with one of my daughters or, well, children, three daughters and a boy, and one of them would come with me. And it was so terrific because you would have a couple of days where it's just, you know, you and them. Yeah, yes, you're in, you're in 
taxis, you're in planes, you're in hotel rooms and so on. But it was like such an adventure and it was one-on-one -on -one time. And we got way more one-on-one -on -one time in that two days than we would in, you know, I don't know what, a month of normal life. So let me spe specify this one-on-one -on -one time. What does success look like with one-on-one -on -one time for you? If you were doing what, what how much one-on-one -on -one per week would you go, you know what, Greg, it's not perfect, but that's progress. I think one-on-one -on -one time for each of the girls, they are very close in age. And so therefore it seems that you're always together. Um, and so one-on-one -on -one time to me would look like um, a meal together somewhere else outside of our home, perhaps. Um, creating something or even baking or making something together. Um, I'm an artist as well. Uh, I love to teach the girls art. And so, in fact, one of the things that I did was I did not schedule anyone else to be teaching art to the girls this year, but me. Yeah. And so that so you, way you, you, I can have individual. That. Yeah. Yes. So, so you're describing some activities that would fit the bill are you wanting, what's the Delta? Are you wanting to have an hour extra per week, an hour extra mm. per day? What's the, give me in. The Delta candle. would probably be at least two more hours alone per week, two, which is, two hours. This is a lot. <laughs> it, it is a lot. I, I recognize that. Um, two hours extra per daughter alone doing something. Yes. When, this is part of a, a family council we would need to take place to make this, you know, operationalize this. But if you just had to choose right now, when would you do it? Would do it? Would it be an evening thing? Would it be an afternoon thing? You know, is there is for there a me morning? probably more of an after probably more of an afternoon to evening thing? Yes, yeah. probably afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so if you got to the point where even one evening a week one afternoon a week, one evening a week, you were spending time set aside with that daughter doing something that they wanted to do, something that you wanted to do together, but it was just one and one with you. You would go, yeah, that is success because that is, that's progress from where I am. Yes. And I know that would add up. That the cumulative effect of doing it just, to, you know, one, even, even an hour, but one or two hours extra of one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, could really creates a lot of opportunity for conversation and connection down the road. Absolutely. And, and, and I'm, I'm sure you already, you know, have experienced this many times, but the power of being side by side in an activity rather than eye to eye. Yes. That sometimes just going on a walk where it's not so intense with a parent, it's inherently quite an intense experience. And, uh, and certainly as a father, I've noticed this, that I need to be, you know, let's go for a walk. Let's be in the taxi together. Let's be on a plane together. Let's let's so it's side by side, so that it just is a bit more equitable. Uh, and so I, I maybe encourage you down that design path. Uh, and I think the the other thing is that it's probably time to be able to have a conversation with them, so that they really get to put their thumbprint on the plan. You know, now we're we're, we're getting closer to sort of designing something here, right? Something real something essential uh let me ask you this if you had to leave this conversation and go and have this conversation with one of your daughters or with whoever in your family you need to have this conversation with now how, how would you go about that what would that conversation sound like i think that i would tell them first of all that this is what i want to do this is time that i that i would love to have with them and I would ask them what their interests, what they would like for us to do, what from their perspective would, would uh, look like a successful time with that, what they're interested in, what, what, um, what makes them, because it, it's all about what makes them as an individual, them as a person feel um, that closeness and that ability to, because in, in these next few years, conversations and the things that we need to communicate with one another will come so much better if we're doing something that they love to do. Yeah, that, that made perfect sense what you said in, in a very collaborative approach that you're taking to be able to talk and you want to have it be give and take and, and all of that sounds exactly right. I want to note something, not as a gotcha moment, uh, because because everybody, and I mean literally everybody does the same thing. There was something missing in that little conversation. Mm. And, and the missing thing was why it matters to you so much. 
and, and why I'm emphasizing this, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm sort of just, just getting on you. I, I, have, I have gone through this similar process with a lot of people over years, many years now. And even where we're in a training format where someone has written out the answers to the questions, what, what, what's essential that you're under investing in? Why does it matter so much? And they're writing it all down. And then they have in front of them an actual written script to have the conversation that you just sort of semi role played there. Even where they do that, when they stand up with the script in their hands to role play it, they will read and skip the second step, which was why does it matter? Mm. People don't share the why. I just wrote about this in a, um, I, I do a one minute Wednesday, uh, an essentialist tiny uh, newsletter. Uh, and, and mine just this week was about this, about starting in your communication with the why. Don't skip it. And, and, and I just think there's such a difference between, hey, I'd love to do this. I want to do this. And, and what do you want to do? That's, that's great. But wow, we've discovered five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, your why was deep, was mm. important. And we assume that our children know this. We assume that our colleagues know this. We assume that our spouse knows this. They don't. And the reason they don't is because they can't. It's the most hidden part of us. It's our motive. It's invisible. And so we have to articulate it for ourselves and then to them. So just give me one more ch chance. Like you're talking to them. Tell me why does the change matter so much? It matters to me because you are getting older and there are many decisions that are coming up in your life. And I want to know that you and I can communicate openly. It matters to me because I want to get to know you for who you are. It matters to me that I want to know what your interests are, what your loves are. And I want to spend time with you because of that. Yeah. I mean, first of all, that changed the dynamic. It felt different to me. How did it feel to you? Felt wonderful. Oh, oh good. <laughs> it feels, yeah. There was a level of why you feel like I'm just ganging up on you now. <laughs> a level of why not shared that I would encourage you to share. When we went layer after layer into the why, at the core of it, it was like, this is the purpose of my whole life. The purpose of my life is to help you to discover and fulfill the purpose of yours. And I want to do anything I can to help bring that forward for you. Mm. And one way I can help to do that, one way I would be interested in doing that is to take some time doing something you would like to do for an hour or two a week where it's just you and I, and we can just do something fun together and something that will help, you know, you to better discover what you like. It doesn't matter what it is to me. We'll just come up with it together. But that's the why for me. Did it feel different to you? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. What we've just done is a microcosm of essentialism. Mm. We've gone past the talking about it, how to ride a bike. We started riding a bike. And in the writing, I just want to explicitly state what we did. We said, well, what is essential? We explored what was essential. We explored why does it matter? We identified specifically what we would need to alter, what the delta would need to be. And we practice going and having that conversation with the people related. That's the process we went through. And that's what essentialism looks like. It's that repeated again and again. We get clear ourselves and then go have conversations with other people. And we keep doing it so that our life eventually starts to become full of the activities and the relationships that are most important to us. And it pushes out all the other stuff that is good, but not essential. Thank you. I would like to keep you longer, <laughs> but I know that you have your time schedule. Thank you so much. I feel like it, it was beautiful. Thank it's you. Been, it's really been my pleasure. Thank you for being open. Thanks for being vulnerable. That will have made it such a difference to the people a part oh, of this. And, absolutely. Uh, and thank you for your sensitivity to what matters. Uh, and, 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 you know, very best of luck for this special year that is ahead of you, this golden year. Oh, well, thank you. Is there anything that you'd like to leave the audience with that you haven't been able to say? Oh, I, I mean, I think maybe the only thing I would encourage with people, 
uh, is, you know, m- my why for doing what I'm doing is that I, it is absolutely my mission in life, uh, my professional mission in life to be able to uh, bring essentialism and the ideas and practices of essentialism to people to practically apply them in just the way that we did. And this is why I launched the Essentialism podcast just recently. Uh, we're doing you know live, not quite live, but live essential interventions with people. And people can write in. They can just write to, to go to essentialism.com and email me with recommendations of people they think should have an intervention. Uh, and, and this is, this is, uh, this is why I'm doing the weekly newsletter now. This is why I wrote the book Essentialism. It's just genuinely to help people to do it. That's my mission, to help people f- discover their essential mission. Oh, if I may, then where can they find that? Uh, if they just go to, literally, if they just type in essentialism.com, there's a newsletter they can sign up for at the top, the One Minute Wednesday. Uh, they can go to the contact page and just uh, say, hey, this is who I'd recommend for one interview. In fact, I just did it this morning. I, I had the most wonderful <laughs> hour conversation with a couple who live in Finland right now. And, and it was just, it was just such a delight again. I, I don't know when that episode will, will, will air, but there's another episode that is airing. It depends when this airs, but, but uh, yes. it, it's, uh, th- there's another episode uh, with uh, uh, BJ Fogg, uh, who, who's the author of Tiny Habits, and instead of just doing the normal interview, hey, tell me about your book, tell me about your expertise, which I was very interested in, I just did an intervention with him. And it was so fun wow. to hear someone at the top of their game as he is analyzing his own life, figuring out what really matters to him, and then making a plan together to execute that. I mean, that, that episode is coming out on Monday. Uh, so, so, you know, this ah. is... To me, this is such a fun journey. It sounds like you're just doing your bliss, right? This is the thing you were meant to do. That's amazing. You know, I'm glad you didn't go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so is the world at large. Any, anyone who cares is, is glad that we, we missed that particular uh, route uh, of misery on the, uh, on the world. Well, thank you so much. I hope we get to get you back at Nelda Live. I would love to hear how all of this is going and how, uh, what, what, you're, what you're doing new. I would love it. I hope so as well. Nelda, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.